Hi, I'm Jonah Comstock, Editor-in-Chief of Pharma Forum. I'm here live at ASCO 23. It's uh, Sunday morning, and I'm joined by Greg Lubinecki. Greg is the Vice President of uh, Clinical Oncology Yes, <laughs> at, at Merck? At Merck, yes. And, and uh, known as, as MSD in uh, other parts of the world, right? Outside of the United States yep. and Canada. And uh, we are going to be talking a little bit about what Merck is up to here at ASCO this year. Now, Merck, people hear Merck, they think Keytruda, right? That's the, the cancer blockbuster you guys have. And that's several of your papers at the conference this year are related to, to Keytruda too, right? Yes, that's correct. We have several uh, presentations here uh, around uh, Keytruda. Which, I, I mean, I think most people know. It's a, it's a checkpoint inhibitor. It's kind of the original checkpoint inhibitor. Um, but uh, tell me about kind of like this year, what's new? How has the work that you guys have been doing with this kind of miracle drug um, progressed and, and what's exciting at uh, this show? Certainly. Um, so what's really exciting this year in the uh, realm of uh, thoracic cancers uh, are the data from Keynote 671, which is a paradigm shifting uh, study result. So for patients with early stage non-small cell lung cancer, stage two and three, um, their overall survival at five years will range on the order of um, uh, around 60% down to uh, around 25% as, you, uh, as the disease is progressively more advanced. And it would be wonderful if we could improve those survival rates. And Keynote 671 may just be able to provide that opportunity. So typically, for patients with this early stage lung cancer, they will be treated with surgery followed by adjuvant chemotherapy for uh, usually three to four cycles. And they will have some benefit from that. And now with the um, approval of checkpoint inhibitors, Keytruda being one of them, they can receive that after the chemotherapy. So while that's what's typically done, in Keynote 671, patients actually will receive the chemotherapy and the Keytruda before surgery for up to four cycles. Then after surgery, they'll receive pembrolizumab adjuvantly for up to a year thereafter. And we see by pursuing that type of treatment paradigm, Patients had a 42% reduction in the risk of the cancer coming back or patients dying. And what's really remarkable is that this treatment benefit is observed irrespective of any baseline patient characteristics such as gender, age, histology, the PDL1 status of the tumor, or how the, patient, how the tumor responded to the neoadjuvant treatment. So ideally speaking, you would have um, all the tumor cells die from the patient's tumor. However, with chemotherapy alone, that seems to be in around 5% of patients. Uh. With the um, Keytruda plus chemotherapy regimen, it's on the order of around 20-ish percent. So there's a significant improvement there, but we've been able to show in a um, type of exploratory analysis that patients will do better if they have Keytruda, whether there is that pathologic complete response or if that pathologic complete response is not present, there's still benefit for using this regimen. In addition, there was a hint or a suggestion that there might even be a survival advantage to using this regimen. It was not statistically significant, and we will have to wait for further interim analyses to test uh, whether there is statistical significance to the survival um, uh, benefit that we think we're beginning to see, but we're anxiously looking forward to those future analyses. But in the end, this really spells great news for patients and is another example of how Keytruda is rewriting the medical textbooks. With a, a study like this where the, the drug already exists, that all the drugs being used are already cleared, but you're, you're studying a new way of using them and a new kind of paradigm of, of when you administer what, 
what's what's the sort of outcome? I mean, you don't have to wait for. Do you have to wait for the like FDA or something to give you an okay based in the study, or is this move right into the clinic and say, hey, like these results are good now, you can start doing it this way, or this is an option you have? So it is true that. Um, in the United States, prescribers are able to um, pursue those treatments they think are best for their patients. But the way, um, what would be best is for physicians to wait until there is FDA approval of the regimen and so that it can be uh, uh, adopted in the uh, healthcare guidelines that are used um, most commonly, the uh, NCCN guidelines here in this country, as well as making sure that um, uh, payers, insurance companies are going to be willing to cover the treatment regimen. So there was a second um, keynote study too, right? And mis mesothemia? Or? So yes, another one of the uh, uh, studies in thoracic malignancies was a uh, keynote 483 in which Merck was supporting a study by the uh, Canadian uh, Clinical Trials Group, the CCTG, in uh, concert with the Italian uh, cooperative groups out of their National Cancer Institute and the cooperative group in France, the IFCT, in which um, pembrolizumab was added to chemotherapy uh, versus chemotherapy alone for patients with uh, pleural mesothelioma. And in that study, it was demonstrated that patients who received the uh, Keytruda plus chemotherapy arm had a 21% um, uh, reduction in the risk of dying uh, with the addition of Keytruda. And this, I think, is uh, great news, first of all, for patients, especially for this condition in mesothelioma, that is relatively rare, and there are few medical advances that take place for this tumor relative to other tumors. And so it's exciting that by adding Keytruda, we're able to um, improve outcomes for these patients. So moving on to sort of a more of a general trend question, um, you've been talking a lot about these really multi-pronged approaches to cancer where you have uh, you know, an immunotherapy, you have chemotherapy, you have surgery, um, and, and there's sort of a very, there's a, a lot of optimizing sort of what order we use this in. What I've been hearing in some of the uh, abstracts and some of the press briefings is this notion that now that we have these powerful um, oral immunotherapies, like let's start to think about toxicity. Let's start to think about where we can reduce the surgery, where we can reduce the radiation um, so that we're not only improving survivability, but also you know, patient experience and financial toxicity and, and physical toxicity. So I was curious about your kind of thoughts about that trend. That seems to be one of the big sort of ideas at ASCO this year is like, now that we have these amazing drugs, how can we, where can we pull back to improve patient experience? And is that something that Merck is, is thinking about too, as you pursue these sort of different avenues for, for Keytruda and for immunotherapy? So yes, the patient experience is critical and paramount. Um, and so we are including and considering the patient experience as we are studying, or as we are preparing uh, the clinical trials before they open, as well as um, during the study, and uh, of course trying to look at data at the end to see how we can also improve the patient experience. Um, there is, I agree with you, that there is a lot of discussion here around how can we maximize the patient experience. I would say that relative to um, uh, standard cytotoxic chemotherapy um, and even um, radiation therapy, pembrolizumab keytruda has, while there are some side effects associated with it, they tend not to be as severe as what you can experience with chemotherapy or radiation therapy. And so, um, uh, I think inclusion of the immunotherapy is important uh, in these regimens. And um, in terms of other study designs, uh, I think some, another way of looking at this might be perhaps this is, for example, in 671, maybe this is the new baseline. And 
are there things that perhaps, or other treatments that might need to be added to uh, the patients who did not achieve a, um, uh, a significant reduction in the tumor burden when the pathologist is looking at the tumor specimen that's come out, because perhaps those patients might need some additional therapy to help make sure the cancer doesn't return, as opposed to um, uh, giving it to patients who did have complete uh, ablation of, of the tumor cells, for which you would think perhaps the current regimen may be um, appropriate. So one more question, because I know we're coming up on your hard stop time. Um, I've been asking everyone I can about a little bit about kind of digital technology and, and artificial intelligence and what role that's playing in oncology research, um, both now and where do you see it going in the next five to 10 years? So I think that certainly with the technological advances that are taking place there um, in the world in general, it's appropriate that they should be applied uh, to medicine as well. In some of the ways that these technologies are being used um, or being explored uh, currently in medicine are typically in the realm of aiding either uh, pathologic review or um, uh, radiologic review of either the pathology specimen or the, um, uh, the imaging. They can be used to help uh, 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 ensure an objective read or at least provide some preliminary read and then humans are able to come in with uh, applying their expertise uh, to uh, make sure that this preliminary read is, um, is working. In some other instances, it may be being explored to uh, help with uh, diagnostic uh, considerations or differential diagnoses. So it's conceivable that five to ten years from now, um, this sort of technology may be used uh, regularly and routinely within uh, clinical practice in those capacities. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Lubinek. This has been a great overview, and I hope you have a great show. I know you've got several more um, presentations to do, and, and uh, it's, been, it's been good to have you. I appreciate you giving us some of your time here. Well, thank you, Joan. It was my pleasure to speak with you. Yeah.